Hello, everybody, and welcome to What the Hell Should I Watch? I'm Steve Stebbing. I'm Chloe Stebbing. And this is our weekly rundown of what we're watching, which will maybe become what you're watching for the next week and weekend. Uh, we come out every Friday at 9 a.m. Pacific time. And uh, yeah, this week we got to see the same movie. Uh, yeah. Although you saw it a night earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, you got to do the Vancouver uh, advanced screening of it which is something I miss about being on the on the coast is being able to attend these screenings because uh, they're a lot of fun. And I, I kind of like Scotiabank as a theater. I think it's a kick in theater. Yeah, I've never been there before. Uh, and we were like late. So just <laughs> panicking the entire time. <laughs> yeah, that you were going to get there on time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, good thing that uh, the people there are, are really good, Jason and Mark, and uh, I think Gary might have been working. There's a bunch of people, probably people that I haven't met before are working it now, but uh, it's good that they take care of us well there. Um, but as far as the film itself, uh, Ghostbusters Frozen Empire, uh, what's it about? When the discovery of an ancient artifact unleashes an evil forest Ghostbusters new and old must join forces to protect their home and save the world from a second ice age directed by Gil Keenan. Was that who directed the first one? I mean uh, Afterlife was done by Jason Reitman, who is okay. Ivan Reitman's son. Uh, so it was that family connection. I went into this movie, honestly, thinking that I don't know why, for whatever reason, but I was like, oh, yeah, Jason Reitman directed this one, too. No, no, he produced it. I think he wrote the story for it. But this is Gil Keenan's movie. Um, very much feels like a legacy sequel. It's, you know, very much trying to honor the original stuff, bring back as much as they can. A bunch of homages in this one. Um, and it's really like a serviceable film. I, I don't like it as much as Afterlife at all. Um, I still enjoyed myself and it reminded me a lot of that. Um, the cartoon definitely way before you were born, there was a cartoon called the real ghostbusters and Egon had this like crazy, like it almost looked like, uh, like cool whip hair. Like he had like this, this <laughs> weird, like, like soft serve type hair. Um, but for establishing Phoebe as a smart character in the last film, damn, was she dumb in this movie? Yeah. Like, yeah, she was extremely frustrating in this. And like, I adore McKenna Grace. I, I largely have enjoyed her in everything I've seen her in. Um, I just don't think that the writing was doing Phoebe any favors whatsoever. And it's almost like there was such a, a gap between the first and second movie. Also, and you pointed this out first in a conversation we had earlier, there is a definite uh, queer thread in this film, and they drop it that so they just quickly. Ignore. Like, they pretend like it doesn't exist, like it's not happening. It was... And it's just like, why, why even put it in there at all then? Yeah, I, I, if, you, if you're not going to pursue it, then why even drop the breadcrumb of it? Because we could all see what you were trying to do. Because there's one season scene in particular that is like so coded that you're like, okay, well, this is the part of the resolution of the movie, then, right? And it just it yeah. never happens. Um, but that the dumb decisions of this movie weren't just relegated to McKenna Grace. They were just kind of peppered throughout this movie. There's one with uh Patton Oswalt that I was like. Are you are, like, I don't really want to give it away for spoiler reasons, but I'm like, really, really, you're going <laughs> to you're just going to freely give up this information. And it's not going to come and bite you in the ass, like, really. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Fun callbacks that make the movie work. It largely kind of holds the film together. The movie is a lot more serious than I think I wanted it to be because there is like a self-serious thing about this movie and there are as go the goofy moments but they feel so dismissive yeah like 
and and even which even to a point makes Bill Murray's character feel kind of weird and awkward in it. But I do love the Peter Vankman character. I don't yeah. care. It, it, I do care that that Bill Murray is apparently not a really nice dude like at all. <laughs> and it's like documented for decades that he hasn't been a nice dude. But I still love this character a lot. Um, there is one scene where all of a sudden he's wearing sunglasses. I don't know yeah. where that came from. And just so he could take them off. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, but that That is a Peter Venkman thing to do. Yeah, that's true. That is very true. But I don't know. I, I, I saw it on this as like a three out of five. It, it, it was good. Enjoyable. Um, do you like need to rush out and see it? I don't think you do. No. I don't know. No, I don't think it's it, like. It did feel like it was a fluff piece, mostly to be like, look, guys, we're still Ghostbusters. We're still cool. Well, and is it a is it a just another like a, a in between to like something bigger because it did feel almost slight there was one thing um i i haven't seen afterlife um i didn't know that it existed (laughs) (laughs) or i just forgot that it did right um so this was the first time for me seeing McKenna Grace in this role. Right. And I know that she's a Spengler, but I want to know the exact reasoning why they made her look like an exact mashup of Egon and um Janine. I, I, Janine, yeah. Yeah, she really does kind of look like a mashup of both of them. I think you should you should go back now and watch the first movie. I mean, what in the first movie, the last movie. Um, to because it is a better representation of all of these characters because even Paul Rudd becomes very one dimensional in this one. Like he's still he's striving to be the stepdad. That's like basically his calling for this movie, and he still wants to be fun. Um, I love Carrie Coon plays the mom. She's so great. I I think she's great in everything. Um, but yeah, I give you a better understanding. Kumail Nanjiani just comes into any movie now and just is Kamel Nanjani, right? Like that's his like that's his yeah. purpose now. He's buff Kamel Kumail just like showing up <laughs> everywhere. Like I I'm I'm okay with it. I'm okay with Patton cuz I I he's part of a nerd culture that I still totally subscribe to and totally love. So I I'm still down with with uh, Patton Oswalt and all the original Ghostbusters like give it up. Yeah. That that was pretty cool. And I mean Dan Aykroyd is Canadian treasure. So um still Still, it's a solid movie, but I don't think you need to rush out and see it, as I said. Um, before we head into the rest, uh, I wanted your quick thoughts on a movie that you took in over the week. And it's an Academy Award winning movie now with uh, Emma Stone's Best Actress. Uh, you watched Poor Things. And uh, how did it go? Very well. I Okay. The only things that I knew about this movie was from when you talked about it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I just saw it on Disney and was like, okay play it um i did not realize that it was two and a half hours long um until i was about two hours through it and i was like wow this movie's still happening um but wow like that that was a full adventure like i was left fully satisfied after that movie like i feel like i got everything that i could have from it Mm -hmm. mm-hmm mm-hmm and it's gorgeous and yes. it, everybody's acting to the rafters. Like everyone keeps talking, you know, Emma Stone's obvious. Uh, Mark Ruffalo got a, got an Academy Award nomination, but Willem Dafoe is Willem Dafoe. And his character is so tragically weird. Like <laughs> when you like all the stuff about his father and everything, it's so messed up. And then um, Rami Youssef. I love Remy Youssef in this movie and that last the the stroll they take in, in the the near the last scene of the movie is such a beautiful character thing because then you like it's the thing that you knew the whole time he was he because I mean he had moments of possessiveness with Bella but mm-hmm. they dissipated so quickly compared to anybody else's so he was like almost the perfect person to be her companion anyway. Yeah. So I don't know. There's a there's something so lovely about this movie, and I I hate that 
when something gets popular or when something gets applauded that everyone tries to tear it down and poke little holes in it. And I don't think you can with the People are trying to with this movie, but I don't think it holds a lot of, a lot of weight to me. Yeah. I, I don't think that those mean anything at all. Mm -hmm. Um, It's just, people don't know how to process movies. Mm Mm-hmm especially artistic ones Mm -hmm. so they're kind of just like like shocked by it yeah um yeah i think that's just kind of it like it it shocks people and that that makes them defensive so yeah yeah exactly it and poor things is definitely one to shock you and uh your your go uh lanthimos just loves to watch the audience squirm and uh, he pulls it off with just beautiful majesty in this movie. So, uh, yeah, poor things. I, I love to talk. I, I like to talk about it. So I was glad to bring it up again. Uh, let's move on. Let's go to the roadhouse. Ex-UFC fighter Dalton takes a job as a bouncer at a Florida Keys roadhouse, only to discover that this paradise is not all it seems. Starring Jake Gyllenhaal, directed by Doug Lyman and available on Prime Video. And I just put Jake Gyllenhaal's name there as almost a placeholder because this um, has a pretty big cast to it. I mean, Daniela Melchor from uh, Su- uh, Suicide Squad is in this. Uh, Conor McGregor is in this. And he is awesome in this movie. He's really, really great. Um, I really enjoyed his villain character like a lot. Um Billy Magnuson is a villain in this too. And I really like it when he shows up and stuff. Uh, if it's not, you know, that Kevin Hart Netflix movie lift, which was a piece of garbage. Uh, but when he has something to work with, he excels post Malone's in the beginning of the movie. Um, and he actually has two country songs, the book and it. And I dig that guy's voice. That guy has got an incredible yeah. voice, like incredible. Um, and the fight scenes are really hard hitting, have some like bone crunch to them. Like the way they're shot is super dynamic. Um, and I think it's a worthy, um, celebration of the original while making, carving its own path because it also kind of leaves itself open to make more, make more of these roadhouse movies. Um, and yeah, I, I dug everything they're doing in it. They don't really have like a Sam Elliott character from the original, the Wade Garrett. They, they don't have him. All of this is probably washing over you because it's some Patrick Swayze movie from the eighties. And you're like, who gives a shit? But I, I just know about the, the family guy gag roadhouse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But this, I mean, to, uh, people that are my age and, and, and men that are older, this is like one of those movies. And it wasn't even like a great, great movie to, I, I know I'm going to get some hate for this. Uh, I, I think my, my co-host Kurt, uh, for, uh, tremble is probably going to give me some hate for this one. Um, it, it found its niche. It found its, it, it, its audience. Right. Oh, and speaking of Kurt, he was mad that we, that I ripped on, um, um, truth or dare last week and <laughs> kurt you know why i ripped on the movie and it still stands <laughs> but anyway that was that one was great for kurt there um there's something about this movie that really 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 works and i think even if you love that original movie you'll love this one and even if you haven't seen that original movie it's action-packed enough to keep you engaged in this one uh, and fun fact, uh, Ronda Rousey was originally supposed to star in the Roadhouse remake. It was supposed to be a gender swap thing. And the notebooks, Nick Cassavetes was supposed to direct it. So that never happened. But uh, also remember, Nick Cassavetes did Alpha Dog, which is a, a great, great movie with a really great action scene in it. So he could he might have pulled it off. Who knows? But Roadhouse, solid movie. Chloe doesn't care. No, and <laughs> I would have cared even less about a gender swapped roadhouse. Yeah, there we go. I, why? <laughs> yeah, they're trying to get the girl audience of Roadhouse. Who? Yeah, exactly. I I, I don't even know. Uh, <laughs> right. Let's move on now to uh, an early review because this movie won't be available for a little bit. This is Greatest Hits. 
a love story centering on the connection between music and memory and how they transport us sometimes literally. Starring Lucy Boynton, David Corinswet, and Justin H. Min. Written and directed by Ned Benson. And uh, this one's on, going to be on Disney Plus on April 12th. So I, I got a little bit in advance. I don't know if you got this one as well. Um, but it is basically a, a girl uh, played by uh, Lucy Boynton who is uh, in, in the world. Uh, she is engaged or married to Rami Malek. Um, but uh, she plays uh she's plays a, a grieving person uh, after the death of her boyfriend and she finds a way to go back through time through by listening very loudly listening to songs that were special to them as a couple and time travel paradox films are really tough in any genre but when you're trying to do a romantic drama with it it gets even messier um, especially when your film is sadly underwritten, which is this film is. I like Lucy Boynton as an actress. Uh, she just a lot of her script does not work in this movie. And it's almost like um, grandiosely corny. Like she always has these big lines that feel like they're, you know, like like off a motivational poster or something. And they're it gets really really annoying and as much as a music-based drama can really get me this one just did not hook into me at all and uh the only the only uh upside is justin h min is really really great in this um not as great as he is in randall park's shortcomings which is still one of the better movies of 2023 in my opinion um, he's still great in this. And uh, this is your opportunity, uh, besides Pearl, to see uh, the new Superman, David Corrin Sweat, uh, although he is not used very much or very well in this film. Um, so I know it's a couple of weeks before it's coming out, but uh, or when this comes out, it'll be a week before it comes out. But um, I think this is a Disney Plus miss, in my opinion. This one, though, I uh, had a lot of fun with uh, for obvious reasons. The big one being David Lynch. It is Lynch Oz. Victor Fleming's film, The Wizard of Oz, 1939, is one of David Lynch's most enduring obsessions. This documentary goes over the rainbow to explore this technicolor through line in Lynch's work, written and directed by Alexander O'Philippe. So I'm a big sucker for a good film documentary. Like anything, like documentaries usually get me. It depends on the subject matter. Subject matter, but when if it's when it's about film and when it's about film theory, I love that kind of stuff. And this one's really cool because it is a bunch of uh, film essays that are examining certain things about about Lynch's work, uh, David Lynch's work over his whole career, and talking Twin Peaks and The Return as well. And even his short films and directly tying them to things within The Wizard of Oz, whether it be Dorothy's journey itself, whether it be Judy Garland's journey as an actress before and after the film. Like there are many things that they're focusing on. And uh, these video essays are done by like John Waters, who is like an absolute legend and a, a friend of David Lynch's whose careers have moved um, almost in a kind of interesting parallel way to each other and they, he talks about that uh david lowry who did um uh the green knight and uh ghost story and a bunch of others which has certain certain lynch qualities to his where he has one uh justin benson and uh, aaron moorhead who are uh the probably one of my favorite um sci-fi horror directing duos working today um and then Karen Kuzama and film critic Amy Nicholson. Like there's a there's a bunch of really cool um, looks, focused looks at David Lynch and just how seasoned he got by watching The Wizard of Oz at a young age, which I didn't know Wizard of Oz was actually a box office bomb when it came out. And it was only because it got brought to television uh, where it gained kind of that um, that that new audience that became that would sit around the TV every year and watch the wizard of Oz at the same time. So they basically built their own audience off of a bomb that cost the studio a lot of money. So it's really interesting. 
And it makes me want to revisit Wild at Heart by David Lynch, because I think that is his most Wizard of Oz movie. And I, I like as far as like now um, getting into new art films and everything, I would say that, Chloe, you would enjoy a lot of Lynch's earlier works like Eraserhead and uh, an Elephant Man and stuff and seeing where where this interesting craft came from because i think lynch would totally be up your alley but yeah i've i've seen a racer head you know it's a staple mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um or blue velvet that's another really really good one yeah you, i haven't seen that one but i think I you would like it. Past it i think you would like it I, I think you would actually connect with a lot of lynch and uh find his stuff kind of fascinating um, because watching this made me really want to rewatch the return because I'm actually watching twin P doing a rewatch of twin peaks right now. I'm in season one. So I eventually I'm making my way to the return, but just seeing it used so many times in this documentary, I was like, Oh, I love that so much. Um, and I also have to mention, this is a criterion collection release film, although it's not part of the numbered collection, it is released under their umbrella. So that same quality is still uh, in check and the cover is really, really, really pretty for it. So I don't have it myself, but I know that uh, one day I'm going to be picking that one up. Uh, so let's move on. Uh, I did a little French. I did two French films this week and uh, let's do the first one. It is Driving Madeline. Madeline leaves small suburbia to join a nursing home on the other side of Paris. Charles, a taxi driver, comes to pick her up and in no hurry to wait. Whoa. Okay, this was horrifically translated from French. <laughs> was it? Okay, I'm not even going to try. I'm just going to say, say it how it is. Okay. Madeline leaves small suburban to join a nursing home on the other side of Paris. Charles, a taxi driver, comes to pick her and in no hurry to reach, she asks him to go through places of the capital, which have counted in her life. <laughs> 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 you got that do you get it did you get it strokes <laughs> starring line uh, lena 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 renaud and danny boone written and directed by christian carrion yes danny boone is an actor that i've enjoyed for a long time uh, a quintessentially french actor he, he, even his face is so craggy in French. Like it, he's <laughs> so like, so like definitely a star of French cinema. And I'm a sucker for these French films. I really am. Always have been. And even more than that, I love a conversation movie where it's just like two characters conversing about life and about, about just connecting. Like I I'm really into that. And I have been for a long time. And this is a trip through Paris, so it kind of reminds me of Before Sunrise. So that collides with that. And I'm like, OK, you've already sucked me into this whole thing. And I mean, it really is a love letter to the city uh, and, and the 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 time that's passed through the city. Um, and both uh, Renaud and Danny Boone are so lovable in this film. Like this is really just plays to being a crowd pleaser and never relents on that. And uh, honestly, it, it makes Christian Car uh, Christian Carrion a, a really interesting director to pay attention to when it comes to these kind of sweet hearted films, uh, because he has like a light touch when it comes to some of the drama. And then when it comes to the emotional beats, especially in the end, he comes in with a freaking hammer because he knows that he's built it up enough to you love the character enough that he's going to get some tears. So, uh, you know bravo i guess right uh so driving madeline solid film um and yeah like again like a crowd pleaser so if you uh if you're into the french cinema you uh, might dig this one all right so the next ones three in a row i did some older uh titles but on brand new blu-ray editions and the first one was uh, a film that was nominated for eight Academy Awards in, in the mid-80s. It is called Witness. While protecting an Amish boy who is the sole witness to a brutal murder and his mother, a, a detective is forced to seek refuge within their community when his own life is threatened. Starring Harrison Ford, Kelly McGillis, and Lucas Haas. Directed by Peter Ware. 
Yes. And this movie, I had never seen it or I'd only seen snippets of it. And so I finally sat down to give it a full watch. And it is Harrison Ford's only Academy Award nomination. Uh, this film was also nominated for Best Picture, Best Director for Peter Weir, Best Cinematography John, for John Seal. John Seal should be known now as the guy that did Mad Max Fury Road and made it look the way it did. Um it won two Academy Awards for Best Adapted uh, Screenplay and Best Editing, uh, but the juggernaut that was out of Africa just annihilated that movie. Um, but it is a solid, solid movie. It is, an, it is a mid-80s cop drama, but it also has this um, slight Dances with Wolves feel because he is forced to flee into the Amish community and basically kind of assimilate himself into the community. Um, so it is an interesting look at that lifestyle and being an outlier of that lifestyle. But also within it, they have a really great scene. And it sounds cliche when I talk about it, but they have a really great barn raising scene. <laughs> I know like it sounds crazy like you had a barn raising scene but it was like so like it it, it was like nice because for the character it shows him kind of finally being accepted into the community because he has some of the skills that could help out this community also within this and through John Seal cinematography you see how kind of they do this and and how in tandem they are with with ropes and pulleys and system and lifting up ropes uh, tools to each other and and joists and cutting them down on the fly and everything because they're doing all this barn raising in one day it's one day or they can't do it right yeah. so it, it that's kind of interesting to look at I, I thought it was kind of fascinating so Harrison Ford becomes Amish yeah well and it's funny because uh harrison ford before he was an actor he was a carpenter so they asked him do you have any or no he's he's uh working on stuff himself and kelly mcgillis's character who's really good in this movie um basically at, at it says oh uh you know you know uh, some carpentry and he's like yeah a little I just thought that was that's a funny little nod. Uh, fun fact about this movie is Sylvester Stallone was an early choice to play John Book, uh, which is Harrison Ford's character in this. And he turned it down. Uh, and he later said that was one of the biggest regrets of his entire career. But I don't think this movie would have been the same with a 1986 Sly in it. I think uh, this was Harrison Ford's movie to make or break and it became I think it's one of his best performances and clearly Academy thought that because he was never nominated again sad sad Han Solo I love that dude though if you watch Shrinking out like he's amazing just amazing let's move on uh to another Academy Award nominated film this was The Contender Senator Lane Hansen is a contender for U.S. Vice President, but information and disinformation about her past services that threatens to derail her confirmation. Starring Gary Oldman, Joan Allen, Jeff Bridges, and Christian Slater, written and directed by Rod Lurie. Yes, and uh, this is a movie that plays so interestingly now because it is basically about um, a woman nominee being appointed to the assistant presidency I'm sorry, to the vice presidency um, and the GOP essentially tearing her down because they uncover an old uh, sex tape, what they believe is an old sex tape of hers. So <laughs> it, it just plays so like like it, it could have happened now and have be still have the same outcome. Uh, but both Joan Allen and Jeff Bridges were nominated for Academy Awards for this one for uh, Best Supporting, uh, Best Actress and Best Supporting Actor, respectively. Uh, this was Joan Allen's first leading role, which is crazy to think about because this is 2000. And Joan Allen is incredible. Like, she is one of those actresses I think is up there with, like, Jessica Lange and, and Susan Sarandon. Like, some of those really, really great actresses. Um, and honestly, Jeff Bridges probably plays the best on-screen uh, president I've ever seen. He has got so much charisma and and charm, and you want him to be the leader of your country. Like he he's <laughs> he's he's Jeff freaking Bridges, you know. And apparently he's playing it. He's modeling this performance after his dad, uh, Lloyd Bridges, who passed away a couple of years earlier before this was filmed. And um, 
it comes through beautifully. I mean, even Barack Obama said this is his favorite uh, theatrical president. So uh, when you're getting it from, I'll say it, my favorite president, um, that he was that that he thought that was a great president, then I don't know. That just kind of that that works for me. Um, but yeah, a really really interesting uh, political film. Uh, Gary Oldman never phones it in he's like anthony hopkins like i I said it last week how anthony hopkins just is always has it turned on gary oldman's that guy too and he says he he said himself that he thought that he wasn't very good in the harry potter movies and i'm like sir serious black ruled and it was because of gary oldman being gary oldman so in my opinion the guy always brings it. So love the dude, but a political movie. So I don't really see it um, being up your alley. Really? I don't mind political movies. Um, yeah, I, I don't mind political movies. I'll, I'll watch them. I think you should, then you should check this one out. Cause it's, I think it's one of the better ones circa 2000 era. Like I, like this, and all, even though it's not political, but it's all, it's, it's also like kind of like scandal and everything, but this and the insider are both really solid movies from around that time. Okay. And uh, so let's move on to the third uh, Blu-ray uh, reissue of the week. Uh, it is the triplets of Belleville. When her grandson is kidnapped during the Tour de France, Madame Souza and her beloved pooch Bruno team up with the Belleville sisters, an age song and dance team from the days of Fred Astaire, to rescue him. Written and directed by Sylvain Chaumet. There we go. And we're going back to France. Uh, another film that is so, so, so French. <laughs> There's so much about the animation that is so French. Like, I was watching it, and my wife Jen's like, this is just so obviously French. Look at his nose. Look at that dog. Look at the way that that's drawn. Look at the landscape. Look at that cityscape. Like that is so French. And it really, really is. Also, another Academy Award nominee. And this was at a different time. This was an this was uh, it had two nominations. The one nomination was for best song. Uh, it was called the Bellevue Rendezvous, which has like a great name to it. It should have won the Academy Award. Instead, they lost to Lord of the Rings, Return of the King, Into the West was the song with Annie Lennox. <laughs> they, they lost to that song. Uh, but it was also nominated for Best Animated Feature. And to think of how far those that that category has come that year, there was only three nominees for best animated feature. It was Brother Bear, Triplets of Belleville, and then the winner, Finding Nemo. There was only three nominees? Like, it's embarrassing to go back and even look at that. They were only nominating three films? For for what year? Uh, Finding Nemo would be 03? Like oh one to oh three, yeah, maybe oh four at latest. Just hold your breath a second. This isn't gonna hurt. What is it? Maybe that at least there's a monochrome more respect when it comes to animated films now. Yeah. I'm just hoping that stunts kind of follow now. We can start awarding stunts with Academy Awards. That's what it's missing, in my yeah. opinion. So but I, I don't know. There's so, this movie's also mercifully short. It's only an hour and twenty minutes. Um it is largely dialogueless. Um and in some parts, it wears out its welcome. Really surprisingly dark in, in parts, but wild because it's a French film. And uh, again, I love a French film. So uh, it's a classic. It's a classic animated one, like one of those internationally animated films. Definite classics. So fun enough. All right, let's move to television. Let's uh, go with Alice and Jack. 
follows the story of a 16-year relationship between two imperfect lovers and its highs and lows, starring Dom Hall Gleason and Andrea Riseborough, created by Victor Levin, and it's currently playing on PBS. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm the old guy now that it's watching Masterpiece Theater. This is a Masterpiece Theater series, um, though it's not like one of those stuffy wigs and, and Downton Abbey type um, Masterpiece Theater. This is a lot more modern and contemporary because it does play take place in a modern time. And I feel like now that a lot of Netflix viewers are just coming off that series one day, um, this series kind of plays like that. It's about two people that have like a quick love affair and then keep meeting again with each other at different times of their lives over and over again. And I, I mean, it comes down to the, to having great leads and Domnall is really, really good. And Andrea Risebrow plays like a very difficult character, a very complicated and, could come off as cold or uh, what's that term? Uh, you might have to bleep this, but serving kind of there, she does a lot of it in this one. She's definitely like that kind of she's guarded. Right. And and she's not going to let anyone in, not even Jack, who she wants to let in. So it, it it's definitely plays a lot with the with, with that dynamic. Um, funny enough, Domhnall Gleeson and Andrea Riseborough have already played a couple before uh, in the movie Never Let Me Go, which if you haven't watched that movie, it will drain you of all of your tears. It is such a tragic, tragic film, but it's also got like the sci fi fantasy quality to it that I think is fascinating. Like it is must see, but oh boy, is it heavy. Uh, Carrie Mulligan's in it, too. Oh, just heavy, heavy, heavy stuff. Um, I mean, all likable actors there. Um, I also like that the series has Aisling B in it. Um, she is a British actress that uh, I see show up in things here and there. And I really have be become quite a big fan of hers. Um, and Victor Levin's no slouch. Uh, he made a movie with Anton Yelchin, who, I mean, rest in peace forever. Anton Yelchin, one of my favorite actors of the 2000s, for sure. Uh, did a movie called Five to Seven with him that I thought was really great. And then uh, the reunion movie between uh, Keanu Reeves and uh, Winona Ryder called Destination Wedding, which is actually a really, really funny movie. Um so, yeah, I'm going to be old and watch some PBS Masterpiece Theater because I'm going to continue watching Alice and Jack. And and then, I don't know, whatever Ken Burns documentary shows up on there afterwards. Who knows? Who knows? But I'm enjoying it so far. All right. <laughs> let's uh, hit up the Netflix for some true crime with Homicide New York. Detectives and prosecutors revisit their most challenging homicide cases created by Dick Wolf. Yeah, Dick Wolf, the guy that did Law and Dick. Order. Dun dun. I mean, yes. this he he is the the police procedural guy, right? Like he's the guru. He's he's the man. Like like uh, Stephen Bochco and all of them. They they you know they they did stuff before, but when Dick Wolf came in, he focused it. He had you know the crime the prosecution, the sentencing, like he had all of that. This one kind of doesn't get through to the end game of all of that, but it gets really nitty gritty when it comes to the actual scene investigation and to focus on New York and hyper focus on some of the, the, the crazy crimes that have happened in New York and in the, the surrounding areas are, are really cool. Um, especially because Barbara Butcher, who is like the investigator at the heart of this whole thing, is such an interesting individual, just how her mind works when it comes to this forensic stuff um, that I, I really, really, really liked. And the first episode is a good hooking point because it takes it's about five random murders that happen in a studio above uh, the famous Carnegie Deli in New York. And uh, just, I don't know, there's something so New Yorker ingrained about this, and especially being uh, a film fan that has loved New York stories for a long time. Uh, seeing these ones in a real context is, is pretty cool. So I've been enjoying it. I haven't ventured much past the third episode so far, but uh, it is still on my list. Yeah, I, I'll, I might check this one out because uh, I'm a huge follower of SVU. Nice, um, nice. And I, I kind of have been for like my entire life because um, it, it started in 1999. I was born in 2000 and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. my grandma would just watch it constantly. 
Um, so yeah, the, the the theme music has just been ingrained in my head. Um, and I love Mariska Hargitay. Yes. So, See, yeah. I'm I'm partial to Chris Maloney. I love Chris Maloney. I'm too. a huge he, Chris Maloney he's fan. He's so funny in mm-hmm. in like his comedy bits. He's so funny. Like, oh, what what was he in? Uh, he's in Harold and Kumar. It, uh-huh. I think I think he was in Half Baked. Uh, he, some some other stoner movie. Wet, he wet Hot American movie. Summer. He was in that. Um, yeah, but it was a different one. It mm-hmm. was like a really like random obscure one that like we we put on and we were like, oh my god, that's Chris Maloney sitting on the couch. <laughs> it was kind of one of those things. My first my first uh, exposure to him was a show called Oz. Or he plays a, okay. an inmate, and uh, I'll just leave it at that. You have HBO now, so you can watch mm-hmm. Oz. <laughs> oh, and all, yes, uh, audience Chloe now has all access to HBO, so she's been binging. Yes. I've already binged the entire first season of The Last of Us. Nice. And I thought the actress who played Tess was super, super familiar. And found out that it's the lead from Fringe. Hell yeah, Anna Torv. Yep. Anna Torv rules. I mean, yeah. I, this is going back, but we were obsessed with Fringe, weren't we? Yeah. Obsessed with that show. It was it's cool. It so was a cool good. Show. It's a damn good show. I want a Blu ray of Fringe. That I, I, I don't know if it's been released on Blu ray yet. I think it needs to get that high def boost. That and Lost needs to get those boosts. I'll pr- you'll probably find you'll you'll probably find that there is them and just probably pop something in now to make me l- look dumb that I didn't know. <laughs> but no, I- just lost lost makes me laugh because I've tried to get through it like three separate times now. Yeah, and I can't. I <laughs> I've never been able to get through it. I get so bored. I can't listen to Matthew Fox just heavy breathe all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. All right, I so like it. <laughs> All right, so a uh, couple season updates. Uh, new season of Dark Side of the Ring is now on Crave. From backstage controversies to mysterious deaths and unsolved homicides, this series explores the darkest stories from the golden age of professional wrestling and tries to find truth at the intersection of fantasy and reality. Created by Evan Husney and Jason Eisner. Available on Crave. I love this. It's uh, it's produced by Vice. Uh, so in Canada, we're able to access it through uh, Crave. Um, each season is incredible because th- this this is basically me bringing in my love of pro wrestling to this show because uh, all four seasons are fantastic. And I don't think you need to be a wrestling fan to enjoy them because they are just kind of like true. Like like I said, they're the dark stories from professional wrestling. So it goes broader than that. Um, and it's narrated by Chris Jericho, who is, in my opinion, the greatest of all time when it comes to when it comes to wrestlers. He is at least the Canadian greatest of all time. Uh, and now he is the regular narrator for the show. And he is really, really great. I, I love it. And uh, um, the creator of the show, uh, the co-creator, Jason Eisner, he is actually the guy that did the movie Hobo with a Shotgun. Uh, if you've ever seen that one, it's such a great movie. I saw that in theaters and just had so much fun with it. It's it's such a wild film. Um, but uh, close to you, episode one of season five uh, is about John Tenta, who is known as Earthquake in uh, WWF. Um, he was born and raised and actually lived his entire life in Surrey, British Columbia. Oh, yeah. interesting. So it was uh, local, uh, a local story there. But yeah, I really like Dark Side of the Ring and I like a good docuseries. And this one just brings that in my love of wrestling. And I'm glad that it's back. All right. So let's move on to Prime Video's uh, reignition of their second season of Invincible. An adult animated series based on the Skybound slash Image comic about a teenager whose father is the most powerful superhero on the planet. Featuring the voices of Steven Yun, Zazie Beetz, and Sandra Oh, available on Prime Video. That's a good cast. 
It's a really good cast, and that that's that's like the short list because J.K. Simmons is in the uh, is a voice in this. Jason Manzukas, uh, Gillian Jacobs, um, uh, Seth Rogen because he's the producer on it. But this is um, this is Robert Kirkman. Uh, he's the one he created Invincible. Him and Ryan Otley, uh, the comic book, and this is just like almost a direct movement of that comic book onto the screen with uh, little variations here and there and i absolutely love it i i think it's my favorite thing that kirkman has done as far as a vi- uh, um a television medium uh, i like it more than walking dead or anything like that um and i i just i love that they're able to tell a superhero story that's still very subversive uh, uh, subversive within like a superman's type of storyline and uh yeah i mean the voice casting is great jason manzukas is a standout for me he makes me laugh every time he's on it and uh I, there really hasn't been a bad episode yet i'm a little peeved that when prime video started season two they released only four episodes and then went on a hi- hiatus for three months that's a little annoying but I'm not going to bitch because I have episodes back. I don't know. Have you start? Have you started Invincible? I think you would like it. Yeah, I haven't watched it. Um, I don't. I don't know why. First episode's massively violent and like okay. unexpectedly. So I, I think you would be hooked pretty quickly. Okay. Yeah, and it's Kirkman. I know you're a big Walking Dead yeah. fan. So and Robert Kirkman, he he's a great writer. So yeah, yeah, it's it's very solid. All right, so let's. I only have a couple more TV here, shows here yet. I know we're going a little long in the tooth here, but uh, this one happens to be about one of my favorites of all time. It's called Steve Martin, a documentary in two pieces. Follows the life and career of actor Steve Martin, directed by Morgan Neville, available on Apple TV Plus. And Morgan Neville is no slouch when it comes to documentaries. He did the Bono on the Edge, is sort of homecoming with Dave uh, Dave Letterman, which was on Disney Plus last year. I did the Mr. Rogers documentary, Won't You Be My Neighbor, which is one of the best biopic documentaries in the last 10 years, easily. And I uh, did the uh, Backup Singer documentary, 20 Feet from Stardom, which was really good. Um, but this is the tide over uh, until we get another season of only murders in the building, which is uh, shaping up to be a, another star packed season. Um, but I really love how they tackled Steve Martin's career in two separate episodes and separating his career in such. So the first episode really is just the stand up part of his career and, and how he he formulated his stardom and inspired so many people along the way like so there's a lot of people out there that still consider steve martin the greatest stand-up comedian of all time it's because he rose to the pinnacle and then he quit he never played his act ever again went into movies made the smooth transition and never went back so and and then i mean his movie career is storied as well so it's like such a fascinating career and a, a guy that i've always loved um when when it's just a sense of humor that i've always got and it was always silly and empirically silly as silly as a kid that you could correlate to it and silly as an adult that you could still find a foothold in and uh yeah i dig steve martin a lot and uh if you like him you'll really enjoy this documentary each episode is like an hour and a half so it's like a three hour movie when it's all said and done so solid stuff and it'll be on apple tv plus well today as this episode is released all right so let's head to disney plus for one more uh this is renegade nell A quick-witted and courageous young woman framed for murder unexpectedly becomes the most notorious outlaw in 18th century England. When a magical spirit called Billy appears, Nell realizes her destiny is bigger than she ever imagined. Available on Disney+. And Billy is like a Tinkerbell-like character. Um, It's played by Nick Muhammad, who played Nate on Ted Lasso. Um, so if, if Ted Lasso fans are looking for another, uh, actor from that branching out, then that the, be this series. Um, and it's a fun adventure series that has like that kind of Robin Hood esque feel to it. Uh, because of course, uh, the, this little Tinkerbell like creature goes 
<laughs> it sounds weird. It goes into Nell's mouth and all of a sudden she can, ha- she has extraordinary powers and, and fighting abilities and everything. And it has, it has an ability. It has a look. So there was a BBC series in the mid two thousands called Merlin mm-hmm. with, uh, with Colin Morgan. And uh, I really liked that show, um, but it had a cheesy quality to it. So Renegade Nell has the feel of Merlin, but it doesn't lean into any of that cheesy quality. It's still very straightforward and I really dig it. And I think it's Louisa Harland who plays Nell in this one um, that grounds it for me and makes it makes it work. Um, There's definitely a queer code to Nell. She definitely feels um, like leaning into the tomboy. Um more than just being a guys. Um, but I, I like her a lot in it and um, some really, really great action sequences and the pilot sets up a good story going forward. Um, also, uh, Fear the Walking Dead connected. Um, Frank Delane is in this show um, and he was in, I don't know how long he makes it in Fear the Walking Dead, but he was the junkie brother that starts the series oh okay yeah that's frank delane he's in this show and he is freaking great in this show i i really really dig him um i i wanted more from him out of fear the walking dead but uh, i'm glad that he's opening up more in other shows so uh renegade nell uh i think i don't know if it's going to be a limited run i could see this going for a handful of seasons so uh hopefully the audience picks up on it uh, and one more for TV. I just watched episode one last night. Uh, this has been out for a while, though, granted, uh, but it's now on Blu-ray. It's called The Act. Dee Dee Blanchard is overprotective of her daughter, Gypsy, who is trying to escape the toxic relationship she has with her mother. Gypsy's quest for independence opens up a Pandora's box of secrets, which ultimately leads to murder. Available on Crave, and Steve is reviewing the Blu-ray. Yeah, I would got I was rece- I received the Blu-ray from moviezing.com and I've been wanting to check this out for a while because it had so much like so much awards around it. Like uh, pa- Patricia Arquette was getting her well-deserved flowers through it. Uh, a lot of awards for her and she really deserved it. But this was like a boost on the star meter for Joey King who plays Gypsy uh Gypsy Rose Blanchard in this one um and does such an incredible job doing it because I mean, where we are now in 2024, a Gypsy Rose, the real Gypsy Rose, just got out of prison last year um, and is kind of in the TMZ news every now and then here and there, um, but has a certain quality to her mannerisms and everything. And I feel like Joey King really nails all of this and and does it so well. Um, I I also mentioned that uh, the neighbors in this are played by Chloe Sevigny and Anna Sophia Robb, two actresses I always love to see popping up in things. I know you're a big uh, fan of Anna Sophia Robb. Um, Yeah, and I also really like Chloe Sevigny. Yeah, she's she's so damn good. And uh, this story... um, the Dee Dee Blanchard stuff and everything. This is so wild and disturbing. The, the, the Munchausen by, what was it uh, Munchausen by proxy or yeah. Um, that she was doing to her daughter is insane and feeding her through feeding tubes in her stomach. And this, this story is, is like one of those, like, I can't believe it's real. Like it's so bad yeah. that someone would do that. Yeah. And I really don't understand the people that are like, well, Gypsy shouldn't have killed her. Like, huh? Well, She's being tortured yeah. for her entire life. Yeah. And if that's the only way that she can, you know, have freedom, then okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, it, it sucks that her mom was sick. Because that's that's what it was. It's it's mm-hmm. mental illness. Yeah. And that's unfortunate, but nobody else was helping her. Have you seen the series? Yeah. Yeah. It's I I yeah, I I got a after episode one, I was like, Yeah, I'm ready to watch more of this. It's it's very I, well done. Yeah. I have it, very strong feelings about the Gypsy Rose case. <laughs> <laughs> it's a whole podcast in itself. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> but yeah, no, a really, really well done so far. I, I, I'm cruising my way through it and uh, enjoying it. Uh, so uh, that's it for the new, well, uh, the new releases, the reviewable releases here. Uh, just a couple mentions here. I got the Hanna-Barbera's Superstars 10 box set which is all which is 10 of the big late 80s primetime Hanna-Barbera television movies uh, all grouped together uh, like the Jetsons meet the Flintstones, which was the last time that most of the original casts did their characters. Um, there's also Rockin' with Judy Jetson, which is the last Jetsons project to feature all the original cast. Uh, Scooby-Doo and the Reluctant Werewolf, which doesn't have Daphne, Velma or Fred in it, which is kind of weird. Um, and also, it was the final appearance of Scrappy Doo before the live action movie in 2002. Uh, <laughs> just, just weird Hanna Barbera facts. Just like uh, Fred Jones was written out of the Scooby Doo meets the Boo Brothers. What reason? What did Fred do to get himself written out of the Boo Brothers movie? Well, according to the Velma show, he's done a lot. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. I, but, oh, God. Let's not talk about those. No, we won't. We'll, we'll just breeze right, pla- right past that one. They don't exist. No, they don't exist. But these, uh, I don't know. I, I love collecting all these old cartoons. So the, so I already have the complete Flintstones on Blu-ray. I got that one last year. So uh, yeah, this one kind of joins it. So pretty pumped about that. Also, yeah. uh, it was a little bit late, uh, but they sent me Aquaman and the Last Empire. Um there's a bunch of special features on this one and none of them are about how awesome Patrick Wilson is um, unfortunately but if you want to hear what are my thoughts on this movie I reviewed it on the December 29th episode and on Letterboxd I gave it a 1.5 out of 5 <laughs> so uh, yeah why did I think that you can go back and uh, find out um, so that is it for this week uh, just to give you a teaser, next week uh, I'll be talking about Godzilla X Kong, the new empire, something big and stupid, no doubt. Um, do you have anything else to bring, Chloe, this week? Um, not specifically, but I did want to bring something up. Um, do you remember the comedian Dimitri Martin? Yes, he has a new he has a new special. Really? Okay, where do I find his stuff? Um, you might be able to find some of it on Paramount Plus, um, or okay. Crave because of Comedy Central. You, uh, important things might be streaming somewhere, but he has a brand new Netflix special coming out in April, and uh, we can request it on our press account. Okay. So just email uh, those great people at Touchwood. Thanks, Touchwood. And uh, they'll hook you up. But you can find this show every week at stevestebbing.ca. Uh, you can find me on Twitter. Uh, you can find me on Twitter, Twitter, <laughs> Twitter, Instagram, and threads and letterboxed at the Steeble Dead. You can find also find episodes of this show on Shane Hewitt's shiftheads.ca and chloe we can find you yeah you can find me on letterbox at honey bun chloe or just chloe stebbing and if you have any questions like kurt had for us last week or just statements you can put them down here in the below and we will address them on the next episode unless they're about truth or dare because <laughs> we're done talking about that movie but until I like then, that movie too. you like that movie too. That's it. I was like a child when it came out. Okay, that's fair. That's fair. You just, you just, you just guaranteed your seat, your seat on uh, Tremble. I think. <laughs> <laughs> but like I said, next week is a new Godzilla movie, a new King Kong movie. But until then, our list is empty, and we got to fill it up again. So bye. <laughs>